Hello, everyone. Uh, we are going to wait a few minutes for everyone to join. Hello everyone, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining to our panel today. My name is Lucia Scandalo, a volunteer from the Argentinian Association of Girl Guides and also a girl-led advocacy volunteer. Uh, and I'm going to be your moderator today. So let me first start with some technical clarifications. If you are in Zoom and you prefer to listen to this panel in Arabic, French or Spanish, Please click where it says interpretation and choose your preferred language to hear from our amazing volunteer interpreters. If your preferred language is Arabic, please click in the Chinese option. At the end of this session, we are going to have a time for questions from the public. So you can type your questions in the chat box of Zoom or YouTube. If you are sharing content of this panel, we invite you to tag wax and use the hashtag team girl and hear them now. So this organization, WAX, is the largest movement dedicated to girls and young women across the world, representing 10 million of girls and in 150 countries. We are here together on October 11 for the International Day of the Girl under the theme of My Voice or, or Equal Future. This year, we're focusing on reimagining a world shaped by adolescent girls' voices, visions, and solutions. 
For us, this means empowering girls worldwide to create advocacy projects and campaigns that are truly led by them. This is why we created an activity pack called Hear Me Now, because we want to give girls a platform to tell us about the causes they care about. So we can all work together through our sunny both future shaped for and by girls. We asked them to tell us what, how they want their future to look like. And these were some of their statements. A future where women live free from criticism, judgment and condemnation. Girls are free to be themselves, no matter where they are from, what they look like or what they wear. A zero waste lifestyle, lifestyle. a future with drug free world a world with where deforestation has ended, a future without war, a world where girls don't have to fight too much to be heard, not fighting about color or religion, all children have access to proper education and be given an equal chance in life. Women can voice out their opinions without being labeled as emotional, a world where girls have access to safe water and basic, basic sanitation to manage menstrual hygiene, uh, and women have more space in governance position and many more. Uh, this is what girls want for the future, a more equal world, a sustainable one with more opportunities and less injustice. Girls show us every day that they have vision, but also potential. Girls are decided, determined and hopeful. We believe that they don't have to wait to grow up to create an impact. They can start now. This is why we decided to host this panel, because we believe that girls have the potential to advocate for their own rights, to shape their own future. And our role as adults is to help them to do the best of our abilities. We choose to name this panel Hear Them Now, because as adults, we need to provide spaces for girls not only to be safe, but also to advocate and speak out. As lifelong learners, it's important for us to listen what girls have to say. We gather here for incredible panelists, Kai Zaragoza from the US, Alina Hassan from Malaysia, Dr. Su Chigar from Geneva, and Hanitra Radisson from Madagascar. All of them have very different experiences and backgrounds, but one thing in common, they believe in the potential of girls to advocate. We hope that you can acquire new tools and ideas today that can help you to encourage and support girls to advocate. Thank you again for being here. And let's start with the introduction of our first panelist, that is Alina. Uh, so a little bit about Alina. Alina Hassan is a young leader from Girl Guys Association Malaysia. Currently, she's holding a three years tenure as a young woman ambassador for the Asia Pacific region and founder of Red Talks, a student led organization aiming to normalize menstruation, advance sexual and reproductive health education, and provide a safe space for all to do so. She's passionate about women's rights and empowerment, particularly in the area of sexual and reproductive health rights and education. Her experience is in the field in this field includes uh, currently working as a youth advisor to the United Nations Population Found Malaysia. Welcome, Alina. Thank you for being here. Uh, what we would like to hear first from you is uh, what does girl led advocacy means to you? And we also would like to know uh, what made you want to become an advocate and why do you think that girl led advocacy is important? Great, thank you so much for the introduction, Lucia. Um, just to address the first question about what girl-led advocacy means to me, my definition of that is very similar to um, WAG's definition of it. But just to deliver this in my own words, I would say that girl-led advocacy is when girls are empowered enough to take initiative to do something which will not only improve their life, um, but the lives of others. So. In this situation, girls are truly at the forefront and they are playing an active role in not only seeing the change, not only um, planning the change, but executing the change as well. I'm not sure if everyone in the audience knows her, but Greta Thunberg and her Fridays for the Future movement would be a great example of what girl-led advocacy is, um, for me at least. She basically wanted um, her government to start taking climate change more seriously 
And she even took up the initiative to sit in front of the Swedish parliament every single week um, to protest. And sooner or later, like, um, it created ripple effects all over the world. And um, Fridays for the Future movement is now global. It has rung so many alarm bells for policymakers um, to start taking action against climate change. And this all just started from one girl, one single empowered girl. Um, to address the question of what made me want to become an advocate, to be completely honest, like I did not have a big bang moment where I said, okay, starting today, um, I'm gonna become an advocate. I think helping others, doing good for um, the world, the community, they're all really natural qualities that people have from birth, at least most people. And it's really just a question of how long you wanna perpetuate this habit throughout your lifetime. For example, when I was still a very small baby, um, my mother always told me that, uh, you know, like I was sharing my toys with others. And obviously now I'm 18 years old, I'm not sharing toys with my friends, but um, my point is over time, these habits of helping and compassion towards others don't just go away. And this action just become more mature as you grow up. Now I'm doing like so many different things like writing petitions to the government to introduce menstrual leave in Malaysian workplaces, for example, um, or conducting uh, outreach programs for disadvantaged girls in my community. My point is um, everything, whether it is sharing toys with your friends or advocacy, it all really traces back to the natural qualities of helping. Now, I, I just wanna talk a little bit about why I entered um, the sexual and reproductive health rights movement in particular. And as a teenage girl myself, I observe a lot of the conversations that are happening around me, especially in my school setting. You have a lot of teenage girls confused about puberty, periods, sex education, and you have adults kind of making it worse <laughs> um, by spreading myths and false education to the younger generation. I'm only speaking from a Malaysian context. Um, this might not be the same all over the world, but it definitely does happen where I'm from. I think it's a really, um, it's, a, it's a perpetual cycle of false information and it only disadvantages women in the long run. So that's why um, I started Red Talks and that's why I really um, got into the sexual and reproductive health rights movement. Um, not, like, or not only to address the importance of comprehensive sexuality education, but to deliver that education to those who need it. And I think girl-led advocacy is so important because it empowers girls. And you should never underestimate the power of an empowered girl. When girls are empowered, like this empowerment carries on for the rest of their lives. And I'll give you an example. Um, let's talk about Free Being Me, the WAGS program. And I think it's a good example of um, promoting girl-led advocacy. And on the surface, it might seem that, you know, it's just a program to make girls love their bodies and have um, body confidence. But I think it, it, it extends much further than that. Um, as someone who went through the program as a participant, as well as a facilitator. And when we empower girls to be confident from um, a young age, this confidence will be ingrained in them for the rest of their lives. And it allows them to thrive, uh, whether it be in a workplace setting or an academic uh, setting. So, or even like it could, um, give them more will to speak up if injustices were to happen to them, such as gender-based violence. And I hope that it doesn't, but unfortunately it does happen to a large majority of women, uh, no matter where you are across the globe. So in a nutshell, like I think girl-led advocacy is so important because it provides girls the platform um, to empower themselves and thrive no matter where um, they are and what stage of their life they're in. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Alina. Um, that was very interesting. I really liked um, 
how you define advocacy with your own experience, especially when uh, you define advocacy as, as something that happens when girls are empowered, and that is very important. Uh, we are going to introduce our next panelist, that is Kai. Kai Zaragoza is a Girl Scout from the USA and a senior in high school. Kai is presently in her 13th year of Girl Scouting as an ambassador. At the age of seven, Kai decided that she wanted to learn how to play the violin and she discovered her passion and wanted to share her music. Despite the fact that music education is imperative to students' academic and social emotional growth, Kai noticed that it was scarce in Broward County. So she took action by creating an orchestra for low-income minorities, students at a middle school. Kai presented results to the school board and ab about the positive social emotional impact on the students and many schools throughout the district now offer that or orchestra. Uh, she's been honored by Girl Scouts USA as a National Goal Award Girl Scout because of her orchestra program at Lauder Lake Middle School and also serves as a Girl Advisory Member of the Girl Scouts Southeast Florida Board of Directors. Welcome, Kai. Uh, we're happy to have you here. Uh, we would like to know uh, what in your life had helped you to become an advocate and what would be your main advice for girls who want to undertake advocacy activities. Hi, um, thank you for the introduction, Lucia. So um, I joined Girl Scouts when I was five years old and for every month for the 13 years I've been a part of Girl Scouts, my troop has conducted and participated in a community service project. So initially as young girls, our troop participated in projects like beach cleanups, collecting food for food drives like Feeding America, uh, collecting books and toys for children's hospitals and collecting items for animal shelters. But now in high school, our community service work has turned into more personal, more involved projects. So we focused on our gold awards and supported and participated in each other's gold awards. Uh, if you're exposed to volunteering and are shown how much of an impact you can have on your community, volunteering and advocacy become an important aspect of your life. Uh, volunteers are the glue that hold the community together. Even helping with the smallest of tasks can make a real difference to the lives of the members in need within your community. The feeling you get when you are able to help another is indescribable. And when you see the impact you have, it's empowering. And especially when you're passionate about something, you'll really want to share that passion with others. So music has always been a part of my life, but I didn't realize how much of an impact it had in shaping who I am until I had to choose my silver award. When it came time for middle school, I really wanted to go to a school that had an orchestra program. There were 10 middle schools within a 15 minute radius from my house that did not have an orchestra program. Here's a quick statistic for you. More than 8,000 public schools in the US are currently without music programs and 1.3 million elementary school students don't have access to a music class. Can you believe that Broward County is the sixth largest school district in the entire United States, serving 271,517 public school students enrolled in over 330 schools and the closest middle school with an orchestra program was over a 30 minute drive from where I lived. I was lucky enough to have a mother who worked as part of the school district and can transfer me to that school and who was willing to drive over an hour every day out of her way to get me to and from school. But why should it be that way? Music education is essential in a child's development, not only because it stimulates the brain and has proven to improve on students' academic development and success, but also because it offers an outlet for stress and anxiety. Every child should have the opportunity to enroll in music class. Every child should have the opportunity to create music and every child should have the opportunity to possibly even discover their passion. Um, I wish to pursue a career as a musician and to spend the rest of my life uh, creating, playing and sharing music. If it weren't for the opportunities that I was exposed to, I would have never discovered my true calling. I cannot imagine myself as anything but a musician and I feel it's important that children are expo uh, exposed to more than just the core subjects for they may never discover their true passions. Once I realized my passion for not only music, but sharing music, my outlook changed on volunteering and advocacy. It was no longer about giving back to my community, but doing it what is right and creating opportunities that change lives. Throughout my entire volunteer journey, I've learned so much, how important it is to communicate, 
to listen, to sometimes just be there for another in their time of need. And I also learned that not everyone is afforded the same opportunities and it's important to go out there and be that change that allows for those opportunities to be presented. And if that's not possible, to create them yourself. As young girls, we don't realize how powerful our voices can be, how powerful we can be. And once you accept that, don't be afraid to use it. If you want change, you have the power to incite it. And there's nothing you cannot do if you don't put your mind to it. Thank you. <laughs>
issues of digital safety, issues of uh, um, the rise in crime, uh, the rise in child marriage, high dropout from school, these are coming in again and again, which makes you think that, you know, going back to your question, is it more experience that is important? Or is it that we need experience that looks at these things more sustainably in looking at creating an ecosystem where um, young girls <clears throat> can focus on creating a future which they want. So it's, it's for me, when I see the question, I keep on thinking about that. What kind of experience are we talking about that adults today have? Uh, is this experience thinking about what are we handing over? What kind of planet? What kind of system are we handing over to these girls? So when I think of young girls today, we know that young women, girls, they, their experiences, their, uh, uh, their spaces that they have access to differ at multiple levels. They differ based on the cultures they come from, the religions they come from, the countries they come from, the different socioeconomic backgrounds girls come from, and also is so highly age dependent, even in the girl bracket, you know, as soon as they achieve puberty, their spaces shrink drastically. So uh, uh, when I think of what kind of spaces we have to build for girls, what, things that immediately come to my mind is how do girls operate in their homes? You know, how do they have safe spaces to engage with as adult, with adults in a more progressive manner? Do we have safe spaces in communities where girls can engage with other girls, you know, as a peer group, but also at the same time also engage and have their voice heard through adults, where they can share their vision, they, they can share their solutions they are thinking of, the challenges they are facing, and can also talk about the environment in a way that environment listens to them and provides them with the necessary tools needed or not uh, to share what they feel like because they are ca capable of doing that, but more like how to go from here to the next level. Now, you know, I think of my initial years as, as a young girl and, and I remember the time when in one of, one, in one of my uh, classes in school, one of the teachers slapped me because I was being too loud. And uh, uh, I was scolded for not sitting like a girl. And the shushing, the shushing which happens with girls, uh, uh, it, it's, we have got better now, but it, ha it is still there. Like we, we are stopping them from expressing themselves. And uh, <clears throat> it's not like they don't know how to express themselves or they don't know how to share their voice. It is that the system doesn't let them question these things. You know, are, are we providing a safe space for them to question the legal system? Uh, uh, question the digital framework, the safety online. Are we listening to them? We are thinking when we are thinking of digital systems, and uh, 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 it is very very critical for us to relook at, at all these dynamics of how we are engaging and consulting with young girls. As adults, like that, I feel is a better responsibility for us. Is a much uh, better space for us to provide them rather than telling uh, them what to do. Now, one of the things that keeps coming to my mind is the uh, worldwide WCA safe space model. We have a safe space model, which uh, uh, is intended towards providing a safe, conducive environment to, uh, to women, young women and girls. Uh, it's a human rights based approach. It's an approach where we are not just talking about safety and accessibility at the core, but talking about elements such as building trust, uh, elements such as intergenerational cooperation, dignity and respect partnership and accountability, which are strong human rights approaches based on which we create safe and brave spaces for young girls and young women to have the freedom to say what they want to say, but also engage in a way that is more productive towards a next step. And it, so I, I go back to the question, you know, uh, it's not like girls don't have innovative solutions. Girls right now are innovating problems. They have all the insights. They have all the experiences uh, 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 to understand because they're going through these things and they are going through it very differently how we went through as adults uh, in our, when we were kids. So for me, uh, uh, my, the things that I keep on coming to is, are we consulting with them? How are we consulting with them? At what layers? Are we seeing young girls as just faces and stories and you know, uh, uh, who are who are on our brochures and on our websites, or who are who are, or 
are we questioning the way we are engaging them in the processes of how we are planning things, you know? And uh, what language do we use when we talk to young girls? Are we, are we speaking a feminist tone? Are we speaking a more, equal, a more inclusive language? Uh, uh, what, kind of, uh, what, what kind of subjects, what kind of issues are we providing training to these young girls on? And uh, uh, are we thinking of uh, digital safety? Are we thinking of elements which will equip them better for the future and uh, uh, in the same space. And when I look at the current context of COVID and the pandemic, I mean, we know that decisions made by adults are not exactly the best decisions and uh, they are going to impact these girls and they are going to impact, they are impacting girls all around us. So it, maybe it is time right now. And maybe this is, today is the day when we actually think about what kind of planet are we leaving to with the girls and boys of our future and uh, are we uh, is are we creating enough spaces for them to engage in a way that they can protect the planet and it goes back to back to what alina was talking about how greta is changing you know the things but greta alone we need we we need so many systems to look at young girls who are be, who are the greta or uh, Luciana or Alina or Kai of these world who are trying to change the way their spaces are, their contexts are. So for me, I think uh, it's no more about experiences of the, girl, of, the, of, the, of adults. I feel it's more about providing the spaces, the, the environment, the, uh, the system in a way that young girls can engage further. Thank you, Suchi. Um, that was amazing how you describe how a safe space, uh, as a space for girls should be. Uh, the question about uh, what are the safe spaces for girls and uh, how we uh, are consulting them and how we need to learn from them to shape those spaces and uh, uh, how the experience of girls and, and, and their context um, are important, are an important thing to have in mind. And also the idea of um, let them question things. Um, it was very interesting, thank you. Uh, and our next panelist, our last panelist is Hanitra Rarison. Uh, she is a Girl Guide leader from Madagascar. She is passionate in food security and wants to contribute to change the nutrition issues in her country. She is an agronomist engineer and is currently pursuing her PhD in food biotechnology in South Korea. Hanitra is a former advocacy champion for WAC's Girl Power Nutrition Program, a member of the Youth Leader of Nutrition Program, Sun Civil Society, a Girl Power Nutrition Trainer and a Program Coordinator for her component association, Fanilon Madagascar. Um, Hi, Hanitra. Um, welcome to the panel. Uh, we would like to know, uh, as adults, what are the conditions that we, are, we need to create for girls to be able to become leaders and advocates? And what is the role of, of adults in girl-led advocacy? Um, hi, everyone. Thank you, Lucia, for that brief uh, introduction. And thank you also for having me uh, as a panelist for today. So for that question, I can say like as adults, what are the conditions that we need to create for girls and to be able to become leaders and advocate? So I will share about my proof, my experience in girl guiding and also from my own background. I think like girls can become leaders and advocate if first, if they feel that they are in a safe environment as Sushi already explained earlier, that safe environment to discover their own talents their own value and skills and safer environment to grow. Because with that safe environment, they can explore more their self-confidence. They need to know themselves to be able to grow, to discover their dream and work on it to realize their dream first. If they will be also a leader, if they are free to learn with their own pace without pressure, each person has their own way to learn and has their own pace for understanding and apprehending something. So freedom feeling us more to fulfill one's potential. And it comes also to freedom to express themselves, to talk what is matter to them. If also they get the right support from seniors, from adults, 
to boost more their confidence in their process of self-development. Role modeling is a sustainable future generation shaping way. And in my experience, I got a lot of support from my family, especially from my mother and also my seniors, my mentors in my component association. So they support me to always go beyond my own limits to remind also me to remind also my value that helps me to face all challenges in my life right now and to become the person who I am. And also I can say also if we get the opportunities to connect with other girls, not just in our community level, but in national or international over uh, international level to be able to share our experience and to learn from the other girls. Because I believe that peer learning is a good way also in the learning process as a person. And last also, if they really know the environment where they live, like the culture, the language, the habits, and also the dynamic in their community. It induces in them the curiosity, like to know the issues to change concerning girls. And if so, girls will be able to be an agent of change and can speak out for the voiceless while interacting with them. So now, what is the role of adults in girl-led? Girl -led, I believe like girl -led is a way to make in practice the value of the intergenerational dynamics in the community. And as adults, we should always stand as guides, mentors for those girls. We should deliver the efficient information to help them to shape themselves, the advocacy they want to do. And we should introduce to them the importance of advocacy and the impact of speaking out, breaking the silent issues in their community in modeling a better world for themselves and also for their community. And as also as adults with an open mindset, we should listen and learn the in and learn the interest of girls to be able to support them efficiently and to offer the opportunity for them to speak out. Like through my girl power nutrition advocacy journey, I got the support from the GPN responsible in national or global level to be able to speak out at any event related to nutrition. Through that, I learned, I grew up and I become an advocate. And also through my Youth Leaders for Nutrition experience, I got a mentor who always follow and check out my growing process. And therefore, I have deduced that mentoring is okay in successful girl-led advocacy. Thank you. Thank you, Hanitra. Um, uh, I really, um, the thing that I, I take from what you just said is especially this inter, inter, intergenerational dynamic, uh, the importance of adults to deliver information and to tell them the importance of advocacy, but let girls speak out and decide for themselves. Um, thank you. Uh, we are going to start our second round of questions. So we are going to go back to our first panelist, Alina. Uh, we would like to know what challenges, obstacles, fears have you faced or are you facing as a young advocate? And how could adults in your life support you better to overcome those obstacles? Right. Um, to be completely honest with everyone, I have faced um, many challenges, obstacles and fears um, as a young advocate. I started formal advocacy when um, I was just about 15 years old. And one thing I noticed uh, when working with adults in particular is that they have a huge lack of confidence um, in young people, uh, especially young girls. And Whenever I want to try something new, they would say, oh, you're still young, just go and study, or you can do this sort of advocacy thing when you're older, not now, those kind of negative sort of feedback. And I'll give you an example, um, just like just now I mentioned about the menstrual leave campaign that I ran with um, my organization, Red Talks. Uh, I cannot ev even begin to tell you how much negative feedback I got um, uh, from the adults who were around me. Um, many people said like this idea was too radical, um, the government would never um, support this, nobody would support this um, as a matter of fact. And what happened when I just ignored them and did it was that the petition got 3000 plus signatures and so many Malaysian women started coming out on social media, started voicing out about the issues that they had with menstruating in the workplace. And 
even then, even though I was, you know, um, seeing those amazing results from the campaign, I was still put in many uncomfortable situations where I felt that I was being silenced uh, when I wanted to do something that I really believed in. And I know that I'm definitely not the only person who faces these sorts of issues. This is a really big problem everywhere um, for young advocates. And I've always thought like, like, I am just like a really small voice in this world. I'm just like a real drop in the ocean. That's another issue I had. Um, I'm not a politician, I'm not a celebrity. I don't have all the money in the world um, to execute all my advocacy projects that I wanna do. Um, but I'm definitely the kind of person who likes seeing the impact of my work. And it has always been a goal of mine um, to make that impact as large as possible. So, Perhaps that is another issue that I had. I think that my voice was too small to make a huge impact. Um, I only realized later on in my advocacy journey that no voice is too small. And if many voices um, were to shout together, it would definitely be heard. Um, so talking about how the, the, the adults in my life could support me better as a young advocate, I think there needs to be a realization that everyone has a learning curve to go through on their own. I think we should really allow the young advocates to experiment, to make the mistakes and to improve, um, rather than just like silencing us and saying, okay, only go through the most conventional route of um, what you're expected to do. I would just like, if, if I can, I'll just squeeze in a little um, story I had uh, with, one of the young girls that I was working with when I was facilitating a free being me session. We were working on um, action projects on how to spread awareness on body confidence and um, within our community. And this young girl, she was very ambitious. Uh, she said she wanted to plan out a huge concert um, with her favorite boy band, uh, singing songs about <laughs> body confidence, loving herself and all that. And Obviously in my head, I was like, there is no way we can have such a huge concert during a pandemic and we'll never ever have the budget to invite, uh, invite her favorite boy band uh, to come all the way to Malaysia to perform the songs. <laughs> but the thing is, I never said this to her face. I never told her this because I don't want to silence her ideas. Maybe soon or later, you know, she will realize that this might not be the most feasible idea in the world, but that's the, that's the journey she will have to take on her own as, an, as a young advocate. I can always help her if she has questions or if she needs support, but what I do not want to do is discourage her from dreaming big. And I think adults should also adopt this mentality to better support our young advocates. Yeah. Thank you, Alina. Um, uh, the, thank you for telling us about your advocacy journey and uh, the importance for adults to uh, let youth experiment and not discourage them, as you said just now. Uh, so we are going to uh, talk with Kai next. Um, so Kai, in your advocacy work, you are really working in your community and growing your impact. You started by creating an orchestra in one middle school and now thanks to you, several other schools in your district offer music education for students of all backgrounds. How have you been able to broaden your reach and what has been particularly helpful in this journey and what could help you to go even farther? Uh, sure, absolutely. So uh, my passion for not only music, but sharing music has led me to putting myself out there and exploring new pathways I would have never encountered. Um, with my project, the most important aspect is communication. It's so important to get the message across that music education isn't just to give children the opportunity to play music during the day, but for its mental health benefits. Uh, mental health includes, you know, our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It affects how we think, feel, and act, and helps determine how we handle stress, 
relate to others and, and make choices. Mental illness affects 46% of teenagers and 13% of children each year. Untreated mental illness in young youth leads to school failure, delinquency, substance abuse, and entrance into the criminal justice system. Music acts as a medium for processing emotions, trauma, and grief, but music also can be utilized as a regulating or calming agent for anxiety and stress. Playing instruments can encourage emotional expression, socialization, and exploration of various therapeutic themes like conflict, communication, and grief, and can be utilized to regulate mood. Uh, because of its rhythmic and repetitive aspects, music engages the neocortex of our brain, which actually serves to calm us and reduces impulsivity. Uh, the percentage of youth experience certain types of mental health disorders has risen significantly over the past decade. And it's so important to offer outlets that can positively affect students' mental health. You know, just one period a day can positively adjust a student's mindset and reduce stress and anxiety and depression. I myself am actually a very shy person <laughs> and going out of my way to communicate with adults, my peers, teachers, counsel, and my community was a journey in itself for me but I was determined to share my passion, which inevitably led me to accomplishing my gold award. You know, you'd be so surprised what can be accomplished by simple communication and networking. The very first orchestra class I held for my gold award was aimed to help motivate the students, uh, help them pick what instrument they wanted to play. I, a young girl, Shamika, came up to me asking to play violin. And when I placed the violin on her shoulder and adjusted her arms to hold the instrument, I noticed she didn't have a left hand. She was so concerned that she wouldn't be able to play like the other children that I didn't even think and automatically told her she would be able to play the violin. Worried <laughs> out of my mind that I made an empty promise and wouldn't be able to do anything for this girl, I went around asking as many people as I could what I could do. A few nights after my parents and I attended a banquet in my community and at the table we were assigned I was speaking about my gold award and some of the challenges I was facing. And one of the people in attendance actually told me that the Shriners create prosthetics. And one of those prosthetics is actually created to hold a violin bow. I was not only able to get her this prosthetic, but be able to shift her violin so that she could hold it with her right hand and play with the bow on her left wrist. Um, this experience taught me so much, you know, the importance of networking and simply just telling your story for you never know who may hear it. You know, being persistent, going out of your comfort zone, staying organized, spreading your message and sharing your passion. They're all critical in the process of making change and moving forward with your advocacy. The most important thing to remember is if you want change, you must take it into your own hands and follow through. It won't be easy, but if you really want something to happen, you can do whatever you put your mind to. Thank you. Thank you, Kai. Um, that was amazing. I think that that's a very good example of why girls shouldn't uh, wait to grow up and get more experience to uh, advocate because you had the tools, you had um, your passion and you used that to change something in your community that you see that was wrong. Uh, and also the importance of vision and commitment. I really like that. Uh, so we are going back with Suchi. Uh, so uh, what we would like to know is how uh, can we inspire girls to engage with their context, uh, consider themselves actors of change and become advocates? And how can we be role models to them in this journey? Thank you, Lucia. Um, I don't know, do we need to inspire girls? They're already so inspired. I think the 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 girls today are full of inspiration. The girls today, and I hear Kalina, Kai, and Hanitra, like uh, just a peck in the whole girls today, uh, 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 you know, bucket. And girls today are inspired. They are, um, they don't need inspiration to know their context or to engage with their contexts to become actors of change. They want to become actors of change. They want to contribute better. They want to make sure that. Uh, they, they want to find solutions to the problems they are facing. 
and they want to question the world i think you know listening to kai's experience and alina's experience just reminds me of the campaigns that i led in school in 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 my community you know on anti be the anti cracker pollution campaign or uh, the the work on female feet side which is which is one of the most rampant problems in india and uh, to menstrual rights program just talking about menstrual pads used to be in in my school days you know talking about menstrual pads used to be uh, a call to the principal's office so uh, uh, it's it's i don't think and that was back then and uh, i feel like i'm sounding too old but still <laughs> you know it was still still long time back 15 years back and right now girls are doing it they are inspired they want to change their contexts they want to solve problems they want to solve problems in innovative ways they are uh, and and i say this knowing so many girls even in villages in 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 asia in in different countries are trying to find spaces for themselves despite the challenges you know be it conflict zones be it the challenges they are facing because of political situations or or socio economic backgrounds i feel like the problem is more in the way we are training them on leadership you know uh the flawed model that this world has practiced on leadership and that is what they are looking at and that is what they are taking in and i feel like we we know that women are better leaders you know worldwide it has been it has it's a, it's a fact now everyone talks about it, especially with so many women leaders in countries in so many countries and they are providing more inclusive solutions they are providing more uh, humanitarian based approaches to the world now is that based because on the gender or is it more because women as leaders who are now sitting at leadership positions have gone through a process of seclusion and have questioned the system enough to understand that i don't need to follow this like that it's a flawed model so i can i can bring in my own approaches so i feel like the leadership model that uh, uh, young girls are seeing needs to be relooked at you know because uh, we are training them to become the same clogs which are creating problems in this uh, in the in the world and in in making the world more sustainable so uh, the current model of leadership has made the world secluded has left more marginalized has further widened the gaps between uh, 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 people across the world not just because of systemic oppression but because of hundreds of years of following the same model you know and not questioning it per se so uh, i feel what we need is uh, uh, in order for them to become better actors of change because they are already actors of change and better advocates is a renewed model of leadership or how they can work around these dynamics and issues that they they personally go through you know at world wide blue sea we have a very innovative model called rise up and uh, it's a model which is based on human rights approaches it's a model that looks at young women and girls and their leadership journey and not just them being leaders because leaders very often and how the world showcases oh you're sitting in a decision making position but actually leadership is more of a journey uh it starts with the process of knowing yourself you know as an individual as a young girl as a woman and uh, uh knowing the reality and understanding our rights and in the reality that we all live in and then from there in uh it goes on to uh strengthening leadership becoming part of social movements becoming part of peer groups which can help you advocate for action now what the leadership model the rise up leadership model for example for uh, uh, is is built on collaborative consultative approaches of, of how peer education and as alina and kai also mentioned like peer education operate and i feel uh, what is very critical are the two steps of knowing yourself knowing building the confidence but that also helps you understand where your inequalities are coming from you know as girls the disempowerment the 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 problems that i'm facing is it just me or is it contextual who because a lot many times what we went through as girls was we were told that this problem is you like it's it's you it's in your head and that's not the reality so that process of knowing self reality is very very critical in a leadership journey understanding because you stop putting the blame of on yourself and your gender and your 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 and stop impacting your mental health from that perspective the second thing in in the same perspective what is critical is that this same 
step of knowing yourself is very very critical to something like what kai mentioned to girls living with disabilities or girls in marginalized groups or who are facing further more challenges and uh, what is very important is the next step of taking that uh, 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 process of knowing yourself and your reality to the reality of the space that you are in and the reality of young women around you or girls around you and how do you work around as a movement to make those things uh, uh, uh different to change those realities and contexts you know uh, our focus me has has to be on fo- on training them on how do we make sure that our solutions are inclusive enough how do we make sure that despite the diversities of uh, of the realities that girls operate in we are define we are developing leadership models and solutions which answer to everyone and leave no one behind so this advocacy and the act of becoming a change agent means them they have to be a part of movement they become like that grows immediately and this journey is what we call as leadership journey because it's not about you getting three opportunities and then sitting at a decision making table and making a decision it's the process you go through the journey you would go through as a leader which helps you make better decisions when you are sitting at a decision making table and uh, it is there are so many complex problems in the world and girls girl advocacy and the way girls are leading it it's more humanistic more feminist more innovative more futuristic and uh, i don't think that we need to be role models for these girls i i don't think uh, uh, that's what we need to be i think what we need to make sure is that we are giving them an environment as i have mentioned previously which makes them change the status quo because we know that it's about the process right now as adults the onus of it's the onus is only on us about the process of what we are provide the journey that we are the conducive journey that we are uh, uh, providing them and uh, it's it, it it is very very critical to look at inclusion from that aspect to look at diversity from that, that aspect aspect and uh, literally literally move away from the uh, uh, concept of let me tell you how it is done to actually saying can you help me find a better way you know because we have failed and we are we are not doing it the way the right way it should be because we can as adults and how historically we have we can only take it to the certain point and now it's it's literally about passing passing the baton so uh, uh i don't think they need role models i think they need the environment to become role models for their own 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 peers Thank you Suchi. Uh I think that that was amazing the the fact that we need to give them that environment and provide them with uh the tools for this leadership um journey uh so they can know themselves being be critical of their context and be empathic and and think about inclusion. Thank you. Um so uh our next question is for Hanitra. Uh so Girl-led participation and advocacy can't happen without a true collaboration between girls and adults. And we would like to know how can we make sure that girls' voices are being heard and valued as much as possible in all aspects in their lives? And how can we truly learn from girls? Uh, I for me, as girls need, ad- need adults to support them and to show them the path the adult have to lead them in the right way to make their voice heard so it is as i said, told already earlier like it is an interdependence between the two generation adults should be open minded and aware that girls have the right to speak out freely and to express their mind speaking out is not just dedicated for adult girls can have a different and innovative point of view rather than adult We should always promote also the girls' value in role modeling them while creating a safe space for them to be listened. We should find also different opportunities about girls in different platform where they can be heard. For example, during my experience as a youth advocate and through care for education advocacy, I got the opportunity to express myself towards many platform or communication tools. So where I can deliver my message and where my voice could be heard. So we should do that to all of the girls also. When we should, as adults also, we should guide. 
facilitate their ideas to make in reality. The way from conceiving their message to deliver it, like where, how, why, who, for whom, for what. So we should support them by giving them the answer of that. It might be from toolkit or from education curriculum or from learning by doing, from journey experiences. So we should just give them the opportunity to try. So how we can truly learn from girls? We can, I believe like we can really truly learn from girls if we give them the chance to try, to give them also the opportunity to make a mistake because we are learning by doing. If we believe truly also on their potential and their capacity. Girls are energetic active and they are really creative. They just need a space to express themselves. So we should give them that opportunity where they can speak out, where they can lead themselves, the change they want to see in their community and we can learn from them, prove their action. To get them and to get uh, guide them in the right path, we should figure out what they are passionate about by co-creation approach or by focus group discussion led by girls. Like I have experienced the co-creation approach and I have discovered that how girls can be passionate about food, what they eat, they're in the co-creation approach for girl powered nutrition. So they can discover by that approach the importance of eating healthy. So we should giving them the opportunity by learning, by making mistakes, and we just here we are just stand, we just stand to correct them and to get them in the right way. Thank you. Thank you, Hanitra. Uh, that was very interesting. Uh, the the idea of give them uh, opportunities to try and make mistakes and learn by doing. So thank you. So those were all the questions that we had for our panelists. Um, thank you for sharing your experiences, your knowledges, your tools, the obstacles you faced. Uh, I think that it's very important, this perspective in girl-led advocacy, uh, to see, as Alina said, girl-led advocacy of something that happens when girls are empowered enough to create action, and uh, everything that we need to assure to um, make them feel empowered, uh, accompanying them in their uh, leadership journey and uh, creating that space where they can experience, they can learn, they can um, make mistakes. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, it's amazing to hear about your personal experiences in accompanying girls and also in your own advocacy projects. Um, and uh, well, it's been especially wonderful to learn about the type of mindsets that adults should have to learn how to truly listen to girls. So thank you. And now we are going to open the space for some questions from the public. I see that there's a few that uh, uh, Tammy took from, from the YouTube page. Um, so I'm going to start. Uh, this is a question for anyone who wants to answer. So for the four of you, and is uh, what to do when uh, you are scared to start an advocacy campaign? Can I go at it first? Yeah. All right. So um, I think the first step is really to understand that it is okay to be scared. Creating change is not easy. <laughs> and it, um, Rome wasn't built in a day. Um, but my biggest piece of advice is to identify your allies and um, support avenues to better support yourself as well as the campaign. So how I would usually do it is ask around um, some people, you know, like, hey, what do you think about this cause? Um, what do you think about starting a campaign uh, around this cause? And gather people who have similar belief systems as you. And then you can start looking for support avenues. And this could be anyone who you think is in a position to help out. It could be an adult, it could be your best friend. Um, so tell them about your plan and see where they can fill in the gaps to make the project successful. Yeah. Can I go next? Uh, yeah, I, I really like what Alina said about um, you know, you it's okay to feel scared. And all of us go through that journey of first feeling scared and then feeling excited and then making mistakes and still going on around it. I think one one very interesting solution that 
uh, Alina touched upon, and I would like to expand is uh, consulting other people. You know, I mean, how do we consult that? I see young girls uh, are using social media a lot these days, and you know, social media as a tool has had multiple uses, but we know that there are solutions even on social media to how to consult your peers in a more collaborative manner and question them and get information from a close group of people by asking the right set of questions related to what you are trying to start an advocacy campaign on. And that kind of closed, small, uh, uh, immediate uh, consulting can help you so much. You know, uh, we, we, we just launched our uh, Week Without Violence uh, uh, initiative which starts on October 18th and we did a very small few months back like two months back we did a very small uh, social media consultation where we were trying to ask people you know what this year you want to talk about young women what do you want to talk about in the in a week without violence uh, this year what do you want to focus on and we left that on them literally because we wanted to people to come up with an idea rather than us deciding, oh, this is what we, the theme should be. Or even our network deciding, we left it on social media. And everyone spoke about how they wanted to uh, understand more and have ideas around how they can work around the violence that young girls and young women are facing because of COVID and because of the impact of the pandemic. So, uh, you know, it's a very, very easy processes. All social media tools have developed those kind of techniques where you can use to see how you can strengthen your advocacy. And there are trainings available on that as well. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a process what we call as co-creation of advocacy campaigns rather than one person sitting in conceptualizing. And, and I think uh, it, it truly helps in developing engagement and building the momentum you need for uh, uh, your advocacy campaign. So I think that's that's one suggestion I want to give. Thank you. Um, our next question uh, for you is, how can adults help to create a safe space for young advocate, advocators? And how uh, do they know when to stop from being over overprotective? I can answer it first, so maybe the over panelist will answer to help me. I think uh, first is to find first the interest of the girls, like what are they interested to talk about, what each, what kind of issues they want to make a change. So that is the key point first, and also to know the limits of the girls and always to give them the opportunity also to thrive and also to develop themselves so they will feel safe, like feel comfortable in that area. And also to not be overprotective is the adults should help them like to co-create their plan, their advocacy campaign. So the, the adults should be just there as like, just to help them, to guide them, to facilitate them, but not to to be like a boss, like, oh, you should do that, but just let the girls to do where they should go, to whom, for what they want to, to do. So that is my point of view. I think I just want to add that it's very difficult for adults to become listeners, you know, passive listeners, just like active listeners, just listeners. And that's where I feel like adults need to work on, you know, because sometimes I see my my one year old daughter do certain things and she's very, you know, adamant. So if I'm trying to stop her, she'll still do. And then my my in my mind, I'm always like, okay, let me just see where she what 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 she's taking me towards. And she's one and a half years and she takes me, and sometimes I find logic in a one and a half year old girl's. Uh, a process of doing things so it's very difficult for adults and I think it's very very important for adults to look at intergenerational processes rather than just looking at uh, uh, it as a, a give process like that pro we know better give process so uh, uh, I think there are very amazing models of intergenerational leadership that are out there which talk about collaborative processes and co-consultative processes like Anitra was mentioning and that is what adults need to look on. I also feel like organize, organizationally and how institutions and colleges and schools operate, that kind of uh, approach to question, you know, as a policy, having a policy saying that we need to operate in intergenerational way. So how do we do that? And that's a good start to go from there to how we further engage, because otherwise the approach is just, oh, we will listen to you, but we will only listen passively and we will do what we have to do. So that needs to change. 
I think that a question that is related to uh, this uh, theme is uh, how to support how to support adults to have the confidence to empower young young people. Um, uh, you know, I think it's a very, very interesting question because adults already feel they, have, they can empower young people and that's not the reality. I think the question becomes, how do we make adults understand that their definition of empowering young people is wrong, you know, and how do we make them understand what actually young people want? to get empowered more. So uh, uh, I think it is, it's important to be, like one of the tools I used to do when I was a young girl and one of the thing that I faced is sometimes resistance from family and parents and coming from India, uh, being brought up in a very patriarchal system. Uh, I learned the art of negotiation very well. And uh, I negotiated my way through up and I would always develop these smart ways of stopping resistance uh, where I would negotiate and try to make them feel like I, th I'm doing what they want me to do, but actually getting my way out of it as a, as a child. Uh, I still practice it. And I think that that was a part of my, that became a part of my leadership journey model, which negotiation became an art. And I feel like adults right now have this thing that oh, young people are always, uh, uh, like always debating but that that's not the reality per se because they're not listening intently they just have a mindset so i think it's important for us to also as adults and i do this and my my, my sister does this like we share practices of how we can listen to our kids better or you know how we can listen to other young people better and young girls better so sometimes my niece who's 10 years old has weird ideas and she comes up with them and my sister looks at me and she says you know i don't know what she wants to do something with robotics and something and connect lego with some and and i say let her do what she wants to do and maybe we, she'll get there. And if she makes mistake, we'll, we'll figure out then. So there are things where we feel like we know better and no, 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 this is not how it's done. So I think adults need to feel more empowered to let go. <laughs> That's where I feel adults are struggling right now. Thank you, Suchi. Um, another question that we have, and maybe uh, the... Uh, two young panelists can help us with this, with your experience, is as a young advocate, how can uh, I ask for help from my MO, from my member organization or national organization? How can they do that? Yeah, um, I'm not really sure how the structure works in everyone's MOs, but um, speaking from my MO's point of view, um, I would just approach a leader tell them my concerns um, or my ideas and discuss together how the MO can support you. And I'm sure they will want to help because like WAGS in itself, like foundationally, um, their, their belief system is to support the girls, support women. So yeah, that's where I would start off. Uh, what I would like to add on that is to also be very persistent. Um, you know, sometimes sending out an email it's not going to be enough and maybe even getting a call is not going to be enough but if you really show that you're very persistent and you keep reaching out and you keep asking for help people are going to know that you really want to do this you know it's, it's very important that when you do advocacy you have to think about how badly you want to do it how important it is to you and then if it is you have to show that so i think it's just important to really be persistent send out emails really talk Maybe I can help them also to get the help from the MO, as I have done, is first also a part time, we have to plan in advance our advocacy plan. And we have to find the key person also, or a person that we know that can support us and can uh, can help us to talk with the MO responsible. Because it's really depend on each MO structure, like how we should run the advocacy plan. But of course, there, there is always a person who will help you if you are persistent, as Kay said earlier. And there will be always a person who will pursue and will follow your advocacy, but just try and keep doing. Thank you. 
Um, so I'm going to ask two questions now because I think that both are related to limitations. So uh, you can answer only one of them or you can answer both. Uh, what uh, to do if you're scared to speak out for yourself, especially for your rights as a woman? And also how to keep uh, the momentum of small advocacy as I am only 11 and have unlimited access to anything? So um, I'm gonna go ahead and answer that uh, from my perspective. So like I said earlier, it depends how, you know, how badly you want it. Um, I think that's so important that first you get in the right mindset because a lot of times, you know, we start something and we never really find that momentum to keep continuing. And after a while, it's like, you know, is this really what I want? And if it bothers you enough that you have to do something about it, I think it's important that now you have to set up that plan to like to bring it out. So, you know, it's important to set your goal and define your message. What are you trying to change? You know, not only how are you going to do it, but what is it? And what exactly do you want to tackle? Um, and then, you know, find a team that's going to help you. Like uh, what I thought Alina said, that was great. Um, if multiple voices call out for help, then you'll be heard. So I think it's really important that you have multiple people to help you and be there for you. And then map out a timeline. Um, what are you going to start? What is your plan? You know, I have to have definitions for yourself on when you're going to finish stuff, because if not, then it's going to get out of your, your hand and you're going to run out and, and it might get away from you. Um, it's important that you really you stay on top of it. And then um, just communicate and network. I think it's really important to do that. Just to echo what uh, Kai said, um, I think this is a really good question because unfortunately in many parts of the world, there are not enough safe spaces for women to speak up for themselves. Um, but as a starting point, I would always go um, and discuss um, this with somebody that you can trust for sure. Um, it could be your mom, your sisters, uh, your friends in school or something like that. Um, and, and combine your voices as a collective. You can always um, speak, speak out for yourselves together. Um, and I definitely think there is a strength in numbers. So um, in terms of, um, you know, continuing the momentum as well for small advocacy projects, this is also something I would find very helpful because the more people you have in the campaign, um, you know, the stronger it will be. So Thank actually, oh, yeah, go ahead. I'm gonna add, um, you know, Alina said, you know, a safe place. And I think sometimes it's hard to go to your parents or even like the teachers or adults. Um, one place that I always think, you know, is an amazing safe place to start is just Girl Scouts in general. Um, Girl Scouts is created to create a safe space for girls to find their voice. And so go to your troop um, leader, your troop friends, you can go to council. I mean, the whole point of them being there is to help you and to give you that that assistance. So I think that's, you know, if you can't find anything else, you always go to them because they'll be there for you. Thank you. Uh, our, next, our next question is about how to overcome challenges from male family members. Maybe I can have a go at this one. Um, I mean, I have experiences, uh, during, especially in my school setting where, you know, um, the boys were probably not as sympathetic um, to a feminist cause as I am, or do not believe in women's rights as much as um, I do. Um, but personally, I, I think it's really important to highlight to the men that gender equality is not something that's going to push them down. It's just going to uh, help women rise to the same level as them. So just because women have their rights and um, their rights are at health, it doesn't mean that they're losing in the situation. So I would definitely try to play on that narrative and um, to convince the men um, who might not be as sympathetic. Yeah. I think um, it's very, very important to, and you know, Alina said it very nicely, but I think patriarchy has been often understood that as only impacting women. And uh, the debate is that it impacts men as much as it does women, but in a very different manner. Uh, 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 and and I, when, I, when we talk about gender equality, it's not that we need to be equal uh, 
by what they are doing we have to do as well and which is often what where it is misunderstood also it's about having equal opportunities and and being able to do what we want to do so uh, with and i do this sometimes even right now with my dad like i try to show him how patriarchy has impacted him as a you know as an as a man and how uh, and he he has three daughters and you know uh, in a world where in asia having only daughters often has meant that uh, uh, you get a lot of uh, social backlash that you don't have a son you know this patriarchy has impacted you like that and uh, with him i often discuss these things even now and and tell him describe to him how as a child as a boy as the first male fam- family member in his in his paternal side in his family side he was only seen as a person who's getting resources in the house and he has not got that uh, 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 that freedom or a safe space to express himself as a child as express himself then as a young man you know adult and that as women in the house we are giving him that safe space because we that that's something we understand the need of that safe space so also for me it's it's a process which men have to understand from their perspective also and um in in something very basic and let like i think the pushback comes when we they feel threatened uh, uh of the ideology that they have lived for so many years and uh, uh they start questioning everything but they won't let it come out so i think that safe space when we talk about safe space is is has to be expanded as a concept to be provided to the men and young boys in the family also for them to express themselves and share why they are doing what they are doing or why they are giving this resistance so i think that's very very important thank you our next question is how how can we convince our friends and families that we are not doing advocacy just because it's a trend and how to make them take you seriously I think um first of all I think we should show them that what is really our goal and what is really the change that we want to to make in our in the perspective what from our advocacy campaign because sometimes friends or family doesn't believe on you doesn't it, they always think that it is a joke or you are just so mature to really speak out about such kind of issues so we have to stand up and also to always say like we are here for the girls and we are the voice for those girls if it's not the girls who will speak about girls who will speak to for them who will help them so we just show them that we are persistent in the work that we are doing so by the time they will believe on you and they will see later or so the change that what change we have made through our advocacy campaign so we should just like even voice challenge we have to overcome voice challenge and to show them our best and also to show them also the results of our action by the time Thank you. Uh this question is specific to Kai. Um uh Kai someone asked you why it was it important for you to share your experience we um uh, uh you had through music and what motivated you to ask for this experience for everyone. So there's many different aspects that were important to me that I had to share my experience uh with music. one of them i would say is it shaped who i am um you know if it weren't for music i wouldn't be where i am today everything that music has done for me it's it's brought me to where i am you know from the multiple orchestras that i've participated in um meeting these people and meeting friends and friends a lot of times shape who you are and um joining these these chamber groups and really learning that music is the only thing i want to do for the rest of my life you know i can't see myself sitting behind a desk or being a doctor or none of that works for me the only thing that would i could ever truly be happy and enjoy doing is music and sharing music and going out there and spreading the importance of music um another thing is that why well, i think it's so important to share my experience of music is uh the society we live in today there's so much happening that can be so overwhelming um you know first of all it's the whole aspect of you know kids in high school 
they have to, there's that idea where, you know, you have to do the best. You have to get these amazing grades. You have to show that not only are you doing good in school, but you have extracurriculars that bring you out from, you know, show that you're different and that you're, you know, you, you're standing out. And so there's so much pressure on you to do great and there's no room for mistake. You know, that, that idea that, you know, if you mess up, well, you gotta hurry up and catch on because, you know, you have to be the best. In order to get into college, you have to have the best grades. You have to do amazing in order to get into college. And then from college, you have to build it to your future. So it's so much, you know, when you're 14, 15, 16, and you have that idea that, oh my gosh, everything I do right now is going to count and it's gonna affect me for the rest of my life. And it's stressful and it gets me too anxious. And there's just, it's so much and overwhelming. So music has always really helped me personally being able to relax. I mean, doing AP classes and then doing all my orchestras and then doing dance and doing Girl Scouts. There's, there's a lot going on. And then seeing what's going on on the news and just thinking, oh my gosh, this is the world that I'm gonna be a part of soon. How am I gonna cope? <laughs> Music has always been very therapeutic for me and it's always given me time to calm down and think, okay, I'll be okay as I'm gonna get through it. And so I think it's very important that all children have this opportunity um, to have that, that sense of, you know, okay, let me go play my instrument for an hour and just relax and have time to really be one with my instrument and just zone out from the rest of the world. And I think it's also important, you know, to get that opportunity to discover passions. I mean, I can guarantee I've had so many people come up to me and be like, man, I wish I learned violin or piano. You know, I quit piano when I was in first grade and if the places I could be if I continued, and there's so many, you know, things that it's not just about, um, yeah, I don't know. There's, it's because I feel like a lot of times people really just care about the core subjects. And if you're behind on core subjects, they double up. So for math, if you're not doing well in math, oh, well, now you have to have an extra math class. So instead of giving you a chance to, you know, maybe discover that you like music or that you like sports, they're adding more onto the math. And so there's so much importance on the core subjects that, you know, there's so many more job opportunities out there. It's not just science and math and reading, but there's, there's the whole music industry, the whole acting industry, the whole musical industry. So I think it's very important to open that, that opportunity for everybody. Thank you, Kai. And our last question is uh, someone that says that is very passionate in working on ending violence against women and girls. And she asks because her MO is very conservative and they don't have, uh, they don't want to challenge some issues because of the, uh, they think church or state might criticize us. Uh, what should she do? Um, I think always do advocacy that you're comfortable with. And if perhaps the, the political environment in your country does not allow that, then you'll have to evaluate what you are comfortable with, what you're not, and only do um, what you feel is right doing. Um, not everyone is like a suffragette, you know, going to burn their bras, you know, rioting on the streets and risking themselves being arrested to get women the vote. Not everyone is like that. Just I would say do what you're comfortable with, explore your options and um, on how to do it safely. That's what I would say. Maybe I can add also, like if you are, the violence against women and girls is really, in, uh, is really an interesting topic. But like in my experience in our MO, MO our MO is church-based. However, we are doing that campaign. We know the violence because sometimes there is a misunderstood of the definition of violence. So you have to find out like what is really the violence and what issues of violence you want to speak up, to speak out and to support for your advocacy campaign. So don't be scared about the criticize from the church or from state because others will always criticize whatever you whatever you will do. So just believe on you and have a self-confidence while doing your campaign. Thank you for the to the four of you. Um, we, th uh, we thank your commitment and we thank uh, the commitment of everyone here today. The fact that you're here to acquire new tools and learn more ways about how to listen to girls and to empower girls is very important for us and our vision. 
uh, we encourage you to invite girls to join our campaign and tell us how they want their future to be, to tell us that. Um, we also invite you to take our U-Report pool. You can start the conversation in U-Report Global on Facebook Messenger and send the word IDG uh, to access our pool that is available in English, Spanish, French, and Arabic. Uh, this will help us to know more about uh, what is important for girls, what their hopes and dreams are, and how they want to transform their environment. Uh, we want to give a final thank you to our amazing panelists, uh, the incredible interpreters, Mariam, Linda, Gisela, Eugenia, and Elsa, and as well to the wonderful JLA team that has been supporting with the logistics. And also to all of you who decided to spend a piece of your Sunday with us in the International Day of the Girl. Uh, thank you all. Thank you to you as well, Lucia. Thank you so much for moderating.